we're going to look at molecular orbitals. The hybridization was a bit tall for getting us the um, geometry of the molecules. And hybridization is a good technique to use, but it doesn't explain everything. One thing it has trouble explaining is the magnetism of molecules. So molecular orbitals provides us the tool to explain magnetism molecules. Since it can describe magnetism, it shows that it's a valid tool, and we use it in a variety of other ways also. So the magnetism, the normal magnets that we put on our refrigerators are permanent magnets. Those are called ferromagnets, ferromagnetic. The magnetism of molecules is between diamagnetic and paramagnetic. So diamagnetic is when we have all of our electrons paired. And with all the electrons paired, it actually slightly repels magnetic fields. So pair electrons doesn't like magnetic fields. It pushes them away. It's not a strong effect, but it is observ observable. And if you want to look for that, uh, YouTube di diamagnetic water. There are a couple of videos on that. Paramagnetic occurs when we have unpaired electrons. Unpaired electrons have a magnetic field to it, a magnetic vector. And when we put it in a magnetic field, that magnetic vector of the electron helps pull it into the magnetic field. So a paramagnetic is pulled into a magnetic field because it has unpaired electrons. Diamagnetic slightly repels the magnetic field because uh, all of the electrons are paired. Molecular orbitals are orbitals that are shared between two or more atoms. And when we create molecular orbitals, uh, we blend together atomic orbitals to form molecular orbitals. And the number of orbitals in equals the number of orbitals out. Same with hybridization, number of or atomic orbitals in gave us the number of hybrid orbitals out. But in this case, the number of molecular orbitals is going to be split between lower energy or bonding orbitals and higher energy or anti-bonding orbitals. So starting with um, hydrogen molecule. So in the diagram here, we uh, on the sides are the atoms. So in the hydrogen atom, we have electron in one S orbital. We blend the one S orbital from each atom together, we're going to get two uh, molecular orbitals. One is going to be lower energy, that's a bonding. One is going to be higher energy, that's an antibonding. We show antibonding with the asterisk. The orbital is going to be directly on the bond axis, so it's going to be a sigma bond. And even the antibonding is still directly on the bond axis, so it's still a sigma bond. So the bonding one, the two S orbitals overlap with each other and they create one big orbital that over encompasses the whole molecule. So this is bonding. We have a lot of electron density between the two atoms pulling the two nuclei together. The antibonding are two S orbitals that are out of phase with, with each other. So they can't overlap. In fact, they end up having a, a node between them where the electron density goes down to zero. So that's still one orbital that can pull two electrons that can go between the two sides of the molecule, but the electron density drops real low, so there's no electrons pulling the atoms together. So if we just had a pair of electrons here and nothing over here, this molecule would just fall apart. So antibonding does not help to pull a molecule together and actually helps to push it apart. So we have one electron each, each hydrogen, so the molecule has two electrons. We're going to fill the molecular orbital up from lowest energy going up. So we put both electrons paired up uh, in the lowest orbital, that's our sigma 1s. So we're going to keep with simple diatomic molecules, uh, homonuclear diatomic, so the same molecule. And if we happen to put in a, a heteronuclear diatomic, we're going to treat it as if it's homonuclear. Uh, the molecular orbitals get very complicated fast, 
when they're not identical atoms. But here we know that uh, the 1s overlap with the 1s create a sigma 1s bonding, a sigma 1s antibody. So other things that we can do uh, with this, well, magnetism, our two electrons are paired up, all paired electrons, that means we have diamagnetic um, molecule. So another thing that we can do is bond order. Bond order is one half the bonding electrons minus the anti-bonding electron. Or we can look at bonding pairs. So it's bonding pairs minus anti-bonding pairs. So in this case, we have one bonding pair, bond order one, where we have uh, two bonding electrons, zero anti-bonding electrons. So one half, two minus zero gives bond order of one. And our bond order should degree with our low stop structure of these compounds. And um, the other one that we do is the molecular or electron configuration. So our designations for our orbital is going to be either sigma or pi, then showing the atomic orbital it's blended from, and then whether it's bonding or antibonding. And then finally, the number of electrons that are in it. So in this case, we have one orbital, a sigma 1s bonding, so sigma 1s, and then it has two electrons in it. So that's our molecular orbital electron configuration. So let's do another small one, helium 2. So each helium has two electrons in one s orbital. So the two 1s's will blend together to make a sigma 1s bonding, a sigma 1s antibonding. We have a total of four electrons. So Put a pair in the bottom orbital and a pair in the top orbital. So our bond order now is going to be one half two minus two or zero. So that means it's not stable. This will not stay together. No matter how much we wish it will, it will not stay together. But if we were to measure it, it has all paired electrons, so it's going to be diamagnetic. The electron configuration is going to be sigma 1s with two, sigma. 1s star with 2. So let's do a, two larger molecules. So let me do a one on right. So for three elements in period two, boron, carbon, nitrogen, uh, their ordering of their electron levels are different from all the rest of the higher elements, starting with oxygen higher. And it's this area where we blend together our 2P, so our 2S is going to look the same as with hydrogen and helium, so we're taking our S, making a bonding, and then an anti-bonding sigma. But with the P, we have three P orbitals from each atom. So three from each is a total of six. We're going to have six um, molecular orbitals, three bonding, three anti-bonding. But for most of the elements, oxygen and higher, the sigma is more is a stronger bond, lower energy bond than the pi. So we're going to have two pi bonds. So those are the double bonds, uh, the triple double or triple bonds. So uh, if we have a single pi, it's going to be above or below the bond axis. Of, uh, but with two pi's, one will be above or below, and the other one will be in front and back. But for most elements, the sigma is lower energy than the, the two pi. But for boron, carbon, nitrogen, there's an interaction between this uh, antibonding sigma 2p and this bonding pi 2p, or the sigma 2p. That pushes them apart. So it pushes the sigma up higher than the pi. So this, for these three elements only, the pi 2p is lower energy than the sigma 2p. So we have a total of five electrons in each atom. So a total of 10 electrons, so we put them in a pair, a pair, then we're going to put in two pair on the pi 2p and a pair on the sigma 2p. So that's our 10 electrons. So our molecular orbital electron configuration will be our sigma 2p with two electrons, the sigma 2p uh, antibonding with two electrons, the pi 2p with four electrons, and then the sigma 2p with four electrons. Our bond order, one half the bonding minus anti-bonding electrons. So we have two, four, six, eight 
binding electrons and two anti-binding electrons. So one half eight minus two, one half six, and bond order of three. And we know from the Lewis structure that this is a triple bond. All of our electrons are paired, so we have a diamagnetic uh, compound. So another one, uh, S2, this is similar to oxygen, diatomic oxygen. Uh, and diatomic oxygen is the one that uh, really demonstrates the strangeness of magnetism. So you can like YouTube uh, oxygen and magnetism and find some videos on that. But in oxygen and higher, so oxygen and sulfur, this uh, sigma uh, P is going to be lower energy than pi P. And one of the differences is that uh, on sulfur, we're on level three. So we're dealing with the 3s and 3p. So we're just going to use those designations. So our 3s will give us our sigma 3s bonding, our sigma 3s antibonding. Our 3p will give us our sigma 3p bonding, our pi 3p antibonding, and we have a pair of those. Our pi 3p antibonding, and we have a pair of those. I don't know if I said this wrong. So this is our pi 3p bonding, pi 3p antibonding, and sigma 3p antibonding. We have a total of six electrons in each atom, so a total of 12 electrons. We do two, four, six, eight, ten. And the last couple here, we have a degenerate level. So we saw that in our atoms, whenever we have a degenerate level, that's orbitals with the same energy, we always want to put our electrons in uh, separate orbitals with parallel spins. That's Hun's rule. So we're going to do that up here. But that means that we end up with unpaired electrons. So our magnetism is going to be paramagnetic with unpaired electrons. And this is what we can see when we uh, Google magnetism of oxygen. We'll see them compare liquid oxygen to uh, liquid nitrogen, whereas oxygen being uh, paramagnetic, it's pulled into the magnetic field. Nitrogen being diamagnetic, it is not pulled into the magnetic field. So our bond order it's going to be one and a half binding electrons minus the antibonding electrons. So we have two, four, six, eight binding electrons. We have two, four antibonding. So eight minus four is four. One half of that is two. So our bond order of our sulfur S2 is uh, bond order is two. And that is the same for oxygen also. Then molecular orbital electron configuration, we have our three S, sigma 3s with two electrons, sigma 3s2, sigma 3s star with two electrons, sigma 3s star with two electrons, the sigma p, 3p with two electrons, sigma 3p with two electrons, our pi 3p with four electrons, pi 3p with four, and then our pi 3p with two electrons, pi 3p star with two electrons. So this is a very useful technique. It's, we only can work with simple molecules, homonuclear molecules, or things that we can model as homonuclear. Uh, when the molecules are, when the atoms are different from each other, these levels don't line up, and then they start to blend on different levels. And we need to do computer modeling to be able to determine how they blend on those levels. Oops, make this. Oh, that's not right.